Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Grow's Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Tuesday, August 26th, 2025, and today we're catching up on some of my field trials. We're talking about what people get wrong about carbon dioxide and curing and storing winter squash. So let's do it. All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to Tilth Tuesday. Every Tuesday this year will be brought to you by our friends at Tilth Soil. If you're looking for compost or propagation mix, check out tiltsoil.com. Link will be in the show notes. I hope everyone is having an excellent week so far. I know it's not that far into it, but hope it's been excellent. I got a little uh, lettuce planted yesterday, got my fresh sheet out uh, to the restaurants, but then I had some meetings, so the farm day was kind of cut short. But Feeling good so far about the fall. Uh, feeling a little more inspiration about doing a little bit more winter production as well, but we'll see on that. Anyway, y'all gonna give this winter a try? Maybe we'll, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit next week. Oh, reminder, tomorrow will be our monthly live show. That will be at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so bring your questions to the old YouTube. Uh, looking forward to that. All right, so uh, because I have a smart and thoughtful audience, you all are awesome, I thought we could have a sane sort of science-based conversation about CO2 because it seems to me that people often uh, misunderstand this gas a little bit, both in the environment and as it relates to our climate. Now, this is obviously a huge subject and I won't be able to cover it all here, but I wanted to just talk generally about CO2 and uh, take a few myths that I've seen sometimes pop up and just kind of give some insight and context there because, well, we are all made of carbon, which was once carbon dioxide, so it's kind of kin. And I think it's a good idea to get to know your kin. Now, if you decide uh, to skip this section because you've already made up your mind about carbon dioxide one way or the other, because there will be some balanced insight here, but know that it's a choice you're making to actively avert your attention simply because something may challenge your beliefs. But when you avoid challenging your own ideas, you lose your nerd license. That's a fact. Sorry, I, I don't make the rules here. All right, so carbon dioxide, or CO2 as we call it, comes essentially from when a carbon atom bonds with two oxygen atoms. And there are quite a few ways this happens. When you eat a sandwich, for instance, some percentage of that sandwich gets exhaled as carbon dioxide. Cows do the same thing when they eat grass and microbes do the same thing when they eat the manure made from that grass. Because of microbes, healthy soil breathes CO2. We call this soil respiration and it can be a sign of microbially rich, uh, an abundant soil. Then there are the plants that are above it recapture it and put it back into the soil, so long as the plants are there to do so, of course. As I've talked about before, tillage releases loads of CO2. As the tillage itself breaks apart carbon stored in little soil aggregates and simultaneously invigorates oxygen-loving bacteria to consume that carbon and breathe it out as CO2, losing that carbon that plants would normally put back into the soil because the plants aren't there to recapture it in a tillage situation. Uh, volcanoes also produce CO2, as does burning carbon, like gas or forest, or whatever the carbon may be. That carbon turns into CO2. CO2 makes up about 0.004% uh, of our atmosphere, but it has an outsized role in trapping and sort of ping-ponging solar radiation back to the Earth. Bear with me here because we are going to talk about CO2 in the atmosphere, but it's important to understand it because it will and does have some effect on plants and farming. One of the things you will sometimes hear, from climate skeptics at least, is that logically 0.004% of the atmosphere does not seem like enough to make a huge difference. Now, no one who cares about agronomy would say that trace elements of something don't make a huge difference because, for instance, as we talked about yesterday, in fact, it takes just one part per billion of a persistent herbicide uh, to affect a plant's growth and yield. Carbon dioxide is similarly potent. A uh, little bit goes a long way. Another argument I see is that the CO2 in the atmosphere is already saturated and adding more carbon will not add more heat any more than adding another layer of black plastic tarps to a garden will necessarily block any more sunlight. The idea being, though, like at some point, there is no point in adding another tarp because the sunlight is blocked, dude, chill. But it's not really how it works. Although there is saturation limit to CO2, and to some extent, the CO2 near the surface of the Earth is well saturated, this argument does not take into consideration the fact that our atmosphere is absolutely humongous, which I think is a word, and has multiple layers going outward. And as those layers gain more and more CO2, which is nowhere near saturated currently, they will begin to trap more and more heat higher and higher into the atmosphere, heating the atmosphere and us. Uh, climatologists, of course, take this into consideration because this is pretty entry-level atmospheric science stuff. But anyway, oh, a skeptic may also say, but more CO2 means bigger, better plants, right? Well, 
Kind of, and certainly CO2 is essential to plant growth. It is, It can be a, a limiting factor in some production systems. It is required for photosynthesis, shouts to my favorite enzyme, Rabisco, uh, except the CO2 must be done in correlation with water, sunlight, nutrient availability, and temperature to actually be effective, or the CO2 is just kind of wasted. Oh, and, and higher CO2 can also result in plants with lower nutrient levels, so, that, so that's a nice bonus. Plants may be bigger, but they probably won't have the same level of nutrition. Moreover, there is a biodiversity concern here because not all plants equally enjoy CO2 rich environments. And further, uh, times in history when CO2 was in greater abundance, the earth was warmer and sea levels were like 10 plus meters higher. Whatever your favorite low lying coastal city now, it was probably not above water then. Not exactly something we necessarily want to return to. Uh, isn't methane worse in terms of trapping heat, someone may ask? Well, in, in a way and uh, in the immediate, yeah, it is. And scientists will tell you that we also need to reduce our methane emissions uh, 100%, especially since those emissions just keep growing from agriculture, power plants, and so on. But the difference between gases like methane and CO2 is just longevity. The methane we release today will be gone in a couple decades, uh, give or take, uh, after wreaking much havoc, no doubt. CO2, however, can last hundreds of years. So it's, it's a longer lasting problem to deal with. But of course, they are both problems, as is another gas, nitrous oxide. Uh, as an aside here, water vapor is another one that gets cited uh, as a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. But water vapor is only around as, as a gas for a few hours to a couple weeks and is a naturally balanced part of our atmosphere. Water vapor emissions, in other words, are not really a huge concern. Last thing, CO2 is not just about heat. CO2 is uh, dissolving in the oceans and leading to acidification that will reduce ocean plant and animal life. Uh, oyster farmers have seen massive die-offs because of increasing quantities of CO2 in the, in, in the water, uh, which ain't great. So if all that is true, why do seemingly well-meaning people espouse the opposite of that? Well, frankly, feeding into people's confirmation bias is a great way to get clicks, and clicks generate money for those people, and frankly, they may believe it, and they may not totally understand the science. Conversely, people have probably clicked off of this, so no doubt, you know, uh, talking about things that challenge confirmation biases like this can can have the opposite effect. Also, when you dig into some of where these ideas sort of originate, it is funded by people like the Heartland Institute, who themselves have a dynamic array of support from the oil and gas industry, who themselves need us all to be skeptical enough to fight any action on CO2 emissions, because carbon dioxide emissions are literally how they make most of their money, save for, you know, like, maybe like makeup and, and creams and uh, when we chew on plastic and in the case of gum. Isn't that wild that gum is plastic? That sort of blows my mind. All that to say, CO2 is important. CO2 is in fact essential to life, but you know, too much of a good thing and all. So I guess let's use that to remind us all to farm in a way that in fact both generates CO2 through good healthy soil life, i.e. soil respiration, but also dutifully, beautifully recaptures it and cycles it back into the soil uh, into more and more plant life and more and more fungal life and more and more microbial life through good soil management practices. Anyway, that was fun. Let me know your thoughts and comments, respectfully of one another, of course, and please avoid the whataboutisms, y'all. Give me a good argument. Uh, but now let's take a trial break. I mean, the break will be legit, but it will be about trials. Anyway, you get it. BRB. Bob White. That's so cool. Today's episode is brought to you by Farmhand. We know it's peak season, you're busy, but the messages you send now are what drive renewals later. That's why Farmhand is offering free instant access to their farmer built newsletter builder. No demos, no setup fees, just drop your logo, upload your list and start sending farm branded emails that boost sales, engage members and save you hours each week. Get free access today at farmhand.partners slash no till. That's farmhand.partners slash no till. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this podcast, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no till growers. I will try to get to questions from everywhere that questions come in, but I will always get to your Patreon questions. Now, today's Patreon question comes to us from Patreon member Dan Berta, who writes, quote, Jesse, I was just watching older videos I had missed, and in the 10-24-2024 show, you talked about biochar and a garlic trial. It got me thinking a rundown of all your trials with a 
short summary of anticipated and actual results might be a good show. Thanks again for all you are doing. Really appreciate your work, end quote. Great, great topic here, Dan. Uh, all right, so what Dan is referring to here is back in October, I planted some garlic with some biochar and some without. And the original idea was being that I would weigh the results and see if there was any measurable difference. But the reality is that we had a spring with record-breaking rainfall, as you will remember, because I talk about my weather probably a little bit too much. Uh, anyway, a whole chunk of that experiment ended up getting washed out uh, on one of the four inch rainfall days that we had and the experiment kind of fell apart. The garlic held on fine and produced a nice bowl, but there were no measurable differences between the areas. Also, here's uh, the thing about my various trials that I'm finally learning to accept. They aren't very good trials. Uh, rarely are they randomized because I'm a farmer who cannot easily keep up with such things. Rarely do I have the time needed to make sure everything I do to those beds is adequately measured and recorded. And moreover, field trials are always going to be less helpful in a climate like ours because, well, uh, four inch rainfalls, uh, wild winds, ice storms. In reality, I've always wanted to run this as a research farm, but when push comes to shove or really just the season gets going, my off season ambitions usually succumb to my in season realities and any data I collect is not as helpful as I want it to be. Uh, not that I don't learn things or observe things, just that my evidence is not always well documented or well enough documented in a way that is gonna be super helpful to other people. So in that way, it's hard to really detail the results from each of my trials because honestly, they aren't very good trials. Some, like the grafted tomatoes, for instance, I know because while I was harvesting that year, I was weighing the harvests, and that in many cases, I was getting 1.5 times to even double the amount of cherry tomatoes from grafted vines than ungrafted, but I did not get a good count over the entire season to see how they were overall. I did not repeat the experiment with the same parameters the next year, etc. However, the ungrafted plants, both years that I ran that, that sort of similar trial, also blighted out. So I didn't really see a need to, to compare those because the grafted plants survived until I literally had to kill them in November so I could go get on with my life. So I didn't have great data, but I had great proof, if that makes sense. Um, that's what my evidence often looks like. A, a lot of really creative ambition running into a wall of reality. So uh, anyway, I don't have a ton to report on about the biochar trials. I think in order to do that one well, I'd have to randomize, have a good control, and use a high tunnel for the best results, honestly. And I would need to have more time dedicated to monitoring. Time is just not something, as you can probably guess, that I have a lot of. This, of course, is why we need ag research. We just need a lot of ag research because the actual farmers who do the work don't have the time or capacity to always run great or helpful trials necessarily. Uh, not that I'm going to stop experimenting. I mean, far from that. And I'll try to continue to improve my uh, methodology. But if we want actual evidence, no-till growers is going to have to hire a research team or something, which would be amazing. Uh, it would just require like hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in more revenue. Eh, no big deal, right? It's a big deal. It's so hard to make money. Anyway, thanks for the question. And I'd be curious to hear what your all's uh, approaches to helpful field trials and experiments as growers look like. Uh, anyway, up next, we're going to take a quick break. And then we're going to talk about curing and storing our winter squash. Be right back. Farmer Claire Coleman here from the Winter Growers Podcast. Did you know that I also founded Real Farmer Care, a nonprofit that supports farmer well-being? From my own experiences farming, I knew firsthand that this type of support was missing from ag, so I decided to do something about it. As of today, there are over 500 farmer recipients of a $100 self-care award, with more applying daily. If you'd like to help, each $100 donated supports one new farmer. Visit realfarmercare.com to donate and learn more. Again, that's realfarmercare.com. All right, so it's winter squash harvesting season for many of us. Uh, this year, the only winter squash I grew was in our milpa patch, which has done fairly well. Uh, it's not the most, uh, not the largest stuff I've seen, and but it stopped raining in July, so that didn't help. Uh, and I did make some mistakes in terms of soil prep and weeding that I talked about way back in, was it May? I think it was May. Uh, anyway, now is the time that we start thinking about harvesting our winter squashes curing them and to then storing them. Of course, not all winter squashes need curing. Curing is just basically where the squash begins to convert some of the starches to sugars, heal wounds on the skin and that sort of stuff. It basically just like stabilizes the, the, the crop so it'll last. Now, the squashes that don't need curing are softer winter squashes like delicata, acorns, uh, spaghetti squash, uh, pie pumpkins, that sort of stuff. Most of these do not need curing and can be sold fresh right out of the field for eating or carving or decorating or whatever your plan for them might be. I suggest eating, especially pie pumpkins, like the, the variety winter luxury, that absolutely will change how you feel about pumpkin pie and for that matter, possibly 
just like the universe. These types of squashes are the ones you absolutely want to pull before frost, whereas some of the more storage type squashes can take a light frost, though to be honest, I, I, I don't really risk that stuff. Now, these uncured types of squashes do not last uh, terribly long in storage, whereas honey nuts and butternuts are the types that, although they may take a few weeks to cure, will store well all the way through the winter. For the squashes you don't need to cure, those can go straight to market and or uh, to a cool dry place like a cellar or just a cooler part of your house, like a, I don't know, basement. Uh, just think 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. If you can achieve that, that's like 10 to 15 Celsius. For the squashes you do need to cure, those will uh, need to be kept somewhere warm and humid for a couple weeks uh, before moving them into the same sort of storage conditions. So that curing stage would be roughly like 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius with as much humidity as you can kind of muster. Uh, here in Kentucky, we are blessed cursed possibly with humidity. So we don't generally have to add extra, but if you're in a dry region or you're trying to reach these temperatures with a heater, you may need to add a couple pans of water around to ensure they get the right humidity levels and even possibly cover the squash with row cover uh, to trap it in there. A greenhouse can work, but obviously you don't want to cook the squash. It's not I mean, not, not yet at least. So make sure the temperatures are monitored uh, very well if you can. Also uh, good airflow will be important. So I like using racks to kind of keep, you you know, uh, with, without a bottom on them, usually like a chicken wire or something to make sure that air can flow above and below the squash during the curing stage, plus fans near the squash just to, you know, ensure some amount of airflow, but not to, uh, you know, dry them out. You don't want the fans directly blowing on the squash, but around it, just moving the air. Again, the humidity part is important once they're cured, as long as they are fully cured and kept in a dry place, you can stack the squash in a couple loose layers, though a single layer generally still preferred so that you can see any rot that happens. And that's pretty much it. Cured squash, can last like six months or more. Uncured squash, you usually get a couple months or so out of that. So uh, in the at least in the right conditions. Otherwise, did I miss anything there? Let me know. And I guess that's it Tuesday. Oh, uh, don't forget tomorrow to join us for the live here on YouTube. That will be at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, which I learned when I talked to John D. Liu is actually 9 p.m. in Beijing. So that's fun, fun fact. Also, uh, don't forget No-Till Growers is now officially a nonprofit 501c3, so donations are tax deductible and greatly appreciated. You can learn more about how to do that in the show notes. Please make sure to like and subscribe and or follow wherever you are getting this podcast. That's an easy way to help us out. Uh, enormous thank you to all of our show sponsors. And if you'd ever like to sponsor the show, you can reach out to farmer michelle at notillgrowers.com huge shouts to willie breeding for the theme music and mike hilbert for the production help and editing also shouts to epidemic sound for the background music that you can hear Tangles. i'm enjoying this one mike no idea what it is but I, i'm digging it pick up a hat or a copy of my book the living soil handbook at notillgrowers.com to support our work big big thank you to everyone over at patreon.com slash notillgrowers where at a certain level or if you just bump up from one level to another or you uh sign up in the month of august and like i said you're you're, you're running out of time there you get a shout out on the show so big shout outs today to mark Hare, who saved the day here uh and and by day i mean the story all right so uh speaking of said story in continuation of this week's story clatter our farm stand guardian cat our term not hers I, clatter has her own term for this uh had just seen a delectable new creature walk into the farm stand and in her typical manner clatter uh takes her little time there observing and watching the this new fresh morsel as it makes its way towards the you know food part of the of the farm stand where all the food is stacked slowly she stalks it crouching and crawling and salivating her pupils dilated and senses heightened and just as she is about to pounce the creature turns around and throws a small rope over clatter's neck and the next thing that clatter knows she wakes up in a large cage in the woods what just happened that is actually for it's going to be for thursday since tomorrow is the live but anyway we'll do that on thursday on clatter kitty in the woodland cage nailed it all right thanks for watching and or listening we'll see you then bye <laughs>